In December 2020, the FDA issued emergency use authorizations for two mRNA vaccines for the prevention of COVID-19. Clearance of this hurdle by the first mRNA vaccines represents the most recent in a series of breakthroughs in the realm of viral vaccines, each one building on the last. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Paul Offit, Director of the Vaccine Education Center and Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Offit has co-authored a perspective article about the history of vaccine development and how it's led to current vaccine technologies. Dr. Offit, in your perspective article, you discuss advances in the development of viral vaccines, beginning with Edward Jenner's discovery that cowpox protected against smallpox. So how has our understanding of viruses changed with the progress in this vaccine technology? Well, in one way that we actually now know what viruses are. I think certainly Edward Jenner didn't know that. He was working in the late 1700s. The term virus was just a nonspecific word for poison. He was just doing phenomenology at its best. He knew that milkmaids and milk cows that had blisters on their udders could get blisters on their hands. And that when they did, that when smallpox would sweep across the Southern English countryside every two to three years, milkmaids wouldn't get smallpox. Hence, milkmaids have fair skin. And so he basically just took the pus from a woman who had milk cows, who had these blisters on her wrists, and then inoculated into people and found that it worked. He didn't know what viruses were. So we gotten better. Now we know what they are and made a series of vaccines since and that are much cleaner and safer and purer than the vaccine that Dr. Jenner made. So as you say in your article, every strategy that's ever been used to make vaccines is being advanced against SARS-CoV-2. Of all of that, which of these existing strategies has shown the most promise? We don't know yet, because all the strategies that have been used to typically make a vaccine, like taking a viral vaccine and activating the virus, like the way we make the inactivated polio vaccine or rabies or hepatitis A vaccines, or weakening the virus, like we do for the measles, mumps, or rubella vaccines, or um, taking just a part of the virus, a typically surface protein of the virus, which is the way we make the human papillomavirus vaccine, the hepatitis B vaccine. The only strategy that's really been advanced, and it hasn't been in this country, has been in China, where they've used an inactivated viral vaccine. And they've been a little bit of a black box, so it's hard to tell exactly how effective that vaccine is. Supposedly, it was more than 90% effective in China, but then a country in South America found that it was only about 50 or 60% effective, so it's hard to know. But what we've done is entered sort of a new era. We have now this genetic vaccine era, where instead of giving a protein or a whole virus or a killed virus, we actually give the gene that teaches the cell to make that protein, that you make the viral protein, then your body makes antibodies to the viral protein. So that brings us to mRNA vaccines. Currently working against SARS-CoV-2, what other pathogens do you think are going to be promising targets for that sort of vaccine? No, it's really an amazing story. I mean, we only had the SARS-CoV-2 virus in hand and sequenced in January of 2020. And within 11 months, we've had two large clinical trials showing that the mRNA technology, one for which we had no commercial experience for any vaccine, was highly effective. And now we know that at least these mRNA vaccines given to tens of millions of people appear to be safe. I think that the sky's the limit. We're going to learn a lot about this technology, and certainly it's now being applied to see whether or not we can make a human immunodeficiency virus vaccine or a malaria vaccine or a better tuberculosis vaccine or a universal flu vaccine. I think we'll learn a lot about this technology. And and not only that, I think the mRNA technology also will advance things like cancer treatments, will serve as gene therapies. It's really a remarkable accomplishment. Overall, how do you think the process of COVID-19 vaccine research and development is going to end up altering the field of vaccinology over the long term. I think we've entered the new era, the genetic vaccine era. And so now we've had what I think we'll probably look back on this 10, 20, 30 years from now and see this as a fairly crude way to offer the genes, to use a viral vector, a human or simian adenoviral vector, to give just a simple mRNA. I think we'll get better and better at this genetic approach. And it is a new era. This breaks new ground. I mean, you could argue that the first real genetic vaccine, in a sense, was the Ebola vaccine, Johnson & Johnson's replication defective human adenovirus 26 Ebola vaccine. That was really the first vaccine. So we had some experience, at least in West Africa, with that vaccine. But we're going to learn a lot about this, and we'll get better and better at it. It will be interesting to see what happens over the next 10, 20 years. Despite the progress we've seen in the United States and in other countries, you say in your article that the full benefits of these existing vaccines have yet to be realized throughout the world. Do you think that the COVID-19 vaccination programs that are currently being developed are going to end up facilitating access to other vaccines? How can we capitalize on the current opportunities promoting global vaccination more generally? No, that's a great question. And it's critical. 
you're only as strong as the weakest country out there. I mean, how much more information do we need that what happens in one country can affect the world? And remember, of the 194 countries currently on this face of this earth, about 130 have not given a single dose of vaccine. I think the advantage of the mRNA technology is you synthesize messenger RNA. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are given at 30 and 100 microgram doses, respectively. A microgram is a millionth of a gram. You can synthesize kilograms. That's thousands of grams. That's a nine log difference. So you really can vaccinate the seven or eight billion people in this world with an mRNA vaccine. You could do that. And so I think we'll see. And not only could you do it, you're going to need to do it. The fact of the matter is we still give a polio vaccine in the United States. Why? We haven't had polio in this country since the 1970s. The reason we do it is because polio still exists in Pakistan. It still exists in Afghanistan. International travel is common. And as long as that's true, everybody's at risk. So it's going to be a while till we can say that SARS-CoV-2 has, is in hand because we're not going to be able to say it until the world has it in hand. Finally, you write that after the development of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines, the next task is going to be to accomplish equitable, efficient vaccine distribution. How equitable and efficient has the vaccine rollout been so far, and what improvements can you see to be made? Well, it hasn't been terribly equitable, and it's getting more efficient, but it certainly hasn't been efficient. I mean, as a general rule, there are those who kind of fall by the wayside to some extent in our public health medical communities. There are certain groups that are underserved. And as a general rule, those groups that are underserved are also less likely to be getting this vaccine. So I think we need to get better at that. And I'm glad that the administration has joined the WHO collaborative to try and make sure that we can get vaccine to everybody. I mean, every life on the face of this earth matters. In, in the face of a limited vaccine, which is to say a limited number of lifeboats to save our lives, you can see the inequities because the people who are wealthier, who have more access, are able to get vaccines where those who aren't can't. And it's been hard to watch. Thank you, Dr. Offit.